Good morning, church, on all sides of me. Good morning to those online. My name is Caleb Morris, and I'm happy to be here with you all today on this Blessed Youth Sunday. Okay, let's get into this. Show of hands, who's heard the phrase, ignorance is bliss, before? At any point in your life, even just once. Okay, good. We have a decent amount. Not everyone. We have a decent amount. Okay, within different contexts, we understand that it can be used as a good thing and as a bad thing, right? So I'm going to give three examples and see where we drop them. Okay, first one. To the teenager locked in a nail-biting final match of a video game late at night on a Sunday... <clears throat> not calling names. Blissful ignorance. No, no, you don't get to call names either. Blissful ignorance can turn the phrase, yo, I got to sign off now. I have school tomorrow. Into, bro, we can't end on a loss. <laughs> One more round. Example number two. To the employee, blissful ignorance can be the joy they feel when they get their salary at the end of a hardworking month unaware of the fact that the coming week, they'll be laid off. Sorry to those where that hits home. And the final one I decided to use, to the five-year-old child of divorcee parents, blissful ignorance can be their only compensation for the harsh reality that though they're accustomed to meeting mom and dad at the breakfast table every morning, they may never see the two of them in the same room again. For those wondering, each of the scenarios has something in common. See, the unawareness of each person within the scenarios could not and cannot change the consequence and or outcome that they would ultimately experience. So in simpler terms, not knowing can't save us from the weight of reality. Make sense? In a similar way, the unbeliever who says, I didn't know God was real, or no one actually showed me, is just as susceptible to the consequence as someone who knew God existed and turned away from him willingly. That kind of bothers me, but I understand it. And I hope it bothers you too, even if you might understand it. I want us to look at a specific verse here for a second. We're going to be reading from the King James Version just for this, because it's what I grew up with. But it is 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What do we get from this verse? We have to study the word. We have to be ready to apply the word. And we have to be ready to explain the word, even what little we understand. So I'd like to address ignorance in three formats today. Ignorance in our approach to God and the word. Ignorance in our application of God and his word. And ignorance in our administering of God and his word. And we'll break down each, looking at the perspective of a believer and an unbeliever, breaking down what we should and shouldn't do regarding the Bible and also hearing what the Bible says about each individual matter. So we have a grasp on what we're planning to do today. With that in mind, let us pray that God would grant us understanding and open our hearts and minds to his word. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here today, this blessed Sunday. I pray, God, that you would be with us, and guide us, Help us to understand your word. I pray that we'd go forward this week, not ignorant, but learning something and continuing to seek you. Amen. All right. Number one, ignorance in our approach. Approaching God as young people, it is Youth Sunday, so I'm talking to us first, myself included. Approaching God as young people, and even some more mature people, can seem daunting at times. True or false? True. Some days we might open the word or kneel in prayer, and we feel like God's just waiting to show us a million things, and it's awesome. 
Other days, we spend 20 minutes flipping through our scriptures and kneeling on our knees and feel relatively nothing. But before I dive any deeper into that, really quickly, Webster's Dictionary defines ignorance as a lack of knowledge, education, or awareness. So we have the context moving forward. An aspect of that ignorance in approaching God is the expectation of each encounter with him being identical to the last. Make it sense? In scripture, we see God interact with different individuals on different accounts in different ways, such as Moses with the burning bush or the fiery furnace and the Hebrew boys. This morning, I want to look at Elijah, specifically his encounter with God. We'll be looking at 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. In Elijah's case, just for a synopsis, God passes Elijah four times. Once in a great wind, once in a mighty earthquake, and once in a raging fire. All pretty great stuff. However, as many of us know, God didn't reveal himself in any of these formats as great and awesome and powerful as they were. Rather, God chose to reveal himself in a still, small voice. Let's read it and see. Reading from verse 11. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So backpedal with me for a second. We notice that despite our often grand ideas of how God should reveal himself in all his majesty, glory, power, etc., sometimes God opts to meet us in a place and in a way that we're not accustomed to. Our ignorance then is believing that God must be approachable by a certain repeated formula. If I do a little dance or sing a little song, God will magically appear. That's not how it works. Something to note, though, the only surefire way to approach God, as seen in the Bible, is through Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the... There we go. You guys are following. (laughs) To approach God, you must meet Jesus. Those are his terms. So the first point on your sermon outline is approach God on his terms. Approach God on his terms. Okay, but time out. If Jesus is the way to God, what about unbelievers? Well, many unbelievers fail to appropriately approach God because they fail to understand him. Understandable. Ignorance in their case comes from a lack of acknowledgement as to how God revealed himself through Jesus and what Jesus said. This then leads to many unbelievers arrogantly approaching God with requirements and a checklist that he must fill out to be worthy of their praise. If that sounds bold and a little bit unwise, it is. (laughs) It really is. As we go, I'll mention different ways and specific examples of what I'm talking about. So the first one is what we're calling the God Rock paradox. I'll break it down nice and simple and I'll act it out because I like to have fun. Imagine I'm God. Crazy, I know. He's better looking than I am. Nonetheless, this is a rock. It's not a water bottle. It's a rock. Don't question anything. This is a rock. Now, the God rock paradox works like this. First, God creates a rock. Bam, there's a rock. You see the rock? You see that? Everyone sees the rock. Second of all, God makes the rock heavy like that. How it's falling? It's heavy. Third bit. Now we're getting into the heat of it. 
The rock now is so heavy, made by an omnipotent God, that the omnipotent God can't lift it. I'm not joking. This is the way it works in the paradox. So the omnipotent God creates a rock so heavy he can't lift it. This is me struggling to lift it. See that? Now the fourth bit, most important, get this. The omnipotent God who's created a rock that he can't lift must then ultimately be able to lift it. Anyone confused? Yeah? Yeah? I'm seeing a lot of blank faces. That's good. That's good. That's good. You're following me. So tell me this. One, how, if we're checking to see if he fills out the rule of omnipotence, how are we supposed to know that he's not lying when he says either A, he made a rock so heavy that he can't lift, or B, B, he's omnipotent at all? Because we don't have a reference for omnipotence. You realize that, right? No? You see, to question omnipotence, you have to have a standard to hold it to. The problem is when we bring an omnipotent God down to our standard, he has to be subject to whatever we are subject to. Thus, he loses his omnipotence. So how are we supposed to question that? How are we supposed to weigh it and query it? Simply put, the method of quantifying omnipotence, if God is truly all-powerful, then obviously anything he creates would be naturally subject to his power. We'll continue. The arrogance of mankind there, though made in God's image, is to think of God only in our image. Ignorantly, we assume that our imaginations can capture that which is a tier of existence above us. Let's look in the Bible and see another example of this. We're going to look at Job 38, 1 through 4, and see how God kind of reacts to this kind of ignorance. Job 38, 1 through 4 says, I love this passage. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge, dressed for action like a man? I will question you, and you make it known to me. If you have all the answers, <laughs> where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, in a human context, that's arrogance, right? Problem is, God, one, isn't a human, and two, he did lay the foundations of the earth. He's not asking him anything forward and out of place. He's just asking him a question. Where were you, Job, questioning me when I laid the foundation of the world? Friends, let's be clear on something. There's nothing wrong in the case of an unbeliever of being skeptical of God. We're skeptical of many things. That's natural. However, there is a very, very, very fine line between being skeptical of God and trying to tell him what he has to do to be God. We cannot read God the requirements of Godhood. So my charge to the Christian is this. Remember the grace of God through Christ's sacrifice is how now we get to approach him. Grace given to us. To the unbeliever, I suggest this. As you consider approaching God, allow him to be bigger than your logic and your requirements. That's the first point. Point number two, ignorance in our application. Okay. Understanding that Jesus is clearly stated to be the path to God, what about the rest of the Bible? I mean, think about it with me for a second. What about the Old Testament? Because Jesus isn't mentioned by name at all in the Old Testament. He's alluded to, but he's not mentioned by name. Or what about the Bible verses that people have used in the past, distorting them out of context to support things like slavery and the Crusades? Yeah, that happened. Well, honest questions deserve honest answers. The, the word used for contorting God's word 
and filling it with our own meanings is eisegesis. Don't worry, you won't be asked to spell it. This is something we can be guilty of in many different ways and many different formats to varying degrees. But the point is, by placing our own biases, prejudices, and preferences into Scripture, we can make allowances for sins through one text while ignoring five others that blatantly contradict us. I mean, the Bible even takes account for this. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, You shall not add to the word I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I commanded you. Keeping that in mind, ignorance in our application of the Bible can be a result of denying its wholeness. Let's slow down for a sec again. Okay, imagine this. You and a friend are having a conversation. We've all been there. Long story short, every time the friend says something to you, you listen, you process, etc., etc. When you go to answer them, they cut you off, and then they miss the point of what you're trying to say. That's pretty annoying. <laughs> now, be honest with me. I understand you people are loving people, and I respect you. For How long are you really going to stay in that conversation? Just let's be serious. Thank you. Honest. I like this guy. Anyway. <laughs> Now, you and your friend are of comparable knowledge. That's how that conversation works. Now, imagine how it must feel for God, who is of infinite knowledge, when we cut him off and then miss the point of what he's trying to say. Just something to think about. Something else to think about. The Bible isn't one verse. It's full of verses. It's all of them together in tandem and in context. So we can't honestly say to God, I'm interested in learning about you, when at the same time we ignore the context he puts into his words and then rewrite the narrative because it makes us feel better. Is that fair? Is that right? Is that honest? So when I say, when the Bible says we must study to rightly divide the word of truth, when you're studying, you have to take it all in context. That's honesty. In that same vein, point number two on your outline is this. Apply scripture truthfully. Apply scripture truthfully. Let's quickly do a contrast here with what it looks like to wrongly apply scripture. The Bible tells us in different ways that God is omniscient. So we've dealt with omnipotence. Now we're dealing with omniscience. Good. A lot of unbelievers have a problem with this concept. So they take the statement, God knows everything, and make it equal to the statement, God causes everything. Dangerous game to play. For whatever reason, the assumption is that because God knows everything, he's also going to abuse that knowledge and force people trapped within time to act and think a certain way, even if it takes them to hell. That ain't crazy. I don't know what is. But let's put that in a context where we can grasp it. Let's say last week, Vinlek announced a scheduled power outage for the Arnis Vale area. I was informed that they did. I didn't know that. But let's say, in light of that, we decide to have church during the same time period. That's our choice. Now, if we choose to be here, knowing that the power will be cut and given a fair warning that the power will be cut, Is it right or fair for us to be angry at Vinlek after we chose to be here? Yes or no? Oh, wow, you guys are honest people. Love (laughs) y'all. Additionally, is it fair for us to claim Vinlek forced us to be here in the hours where the blackout would happen? No. Choices have consequences. We agree on that. And just because God tells us the consequence beforehand, which again, he doesn't have to, but he does, doesn't mean that he forces us to sit through those consequences. Doesn't mean that he says to us, you must face these consequences with no other option. No, 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 time out. Jesus bled and died by choice. He offers salvation from that choice. So we have an out. 
As C.S. Lewis said in The Great Divorce, I love that book, at the end of time, either man will submit to God or God will relent to man. It's only one of the two. And a lot of times as humans, we relate to God. We, I guess, picture God in our minds and his character through the lens of human nature. We put our character on God and then fault him for things he does. Now, even within this sermon, I've used comparative analogies to help with illustrating my points. That's something similar, but it's also something natural that we do. However, at the end of the day, we have to be able to step back from what we normally might do, from what we naturally might do, and say, time out, time out, time out, hang on a sec. God is bigger than my logic. God is greater than my character flaws. I mean, that's why he's worthy of praise. Truthful application of the scripture helps us to understand this personal, powerful, and wise God for who he is. So we must apply scripture truthfully. My charge to the Christian is this. Apply scripture in its wholeness because it was wholly given to you. Not bits and pieces, the entire thing. To the unbeliever, if you are skeptical of scripture, be thorough in your observation. Critique the evidence, but weigh it fairly. And after all of that is said and done, taste and see that the Lord is good. Point three, ignorance in our administering. Now, this is the most complex one, so I want you guys to really follow with me here. Up to this point, we've looked at the way we personally handle the Bible, individual to individual. I'd be remiss, however, if I didn't acknowledge the reality of sharing the scripture with others. You see, it's difficult to do that. Let's call it what it is. It's difficult to share the gospel because we make mistakes. Because sometimes we try to convince other people or we try to wrestle with other people until we can prove ourselves right. In doing so, we miss the point that it's not what we do, it's what God did. Right? Even on this platform, my purpose isn't to preach down to you from my wealth of knowledge. It's really not that great. Rather, my purpose standing here before you, is to share with you what I'm learning and what I've learned. We're in this together. Let's hear what the Bible says about the whole process. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This alludes to the gospel being more than just people talking about God and theorizing. But no, the power of the gospel, it's the power of God through our active obedience to the great commission, go out into all the world and preach, which opens the door for God to step in and influence the heart of an unbeliever. Again, it's not what we do, it's what God has done. Another passage on how Christ acts regarding the heart of man is Revelation 3. 20. It says, behold, I stand at the door and kick it down. No. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, no limitations on that. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. So again, we have a personal choice there. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Action. Reaction. If we choose to open the door, he will come in. This verse reinforces the weight of choice. Christ here is making his presence known. He's not hiding. He's not pretending not to be there. No, he's he's making himself known. He's not forcing his way into our lives, however. He's leaving the chance for us to choose. Every one of us. Another example of this, think of life as a road for a second. Temptation is the fork in the path that we all come to at different points. On one path, 
We see Christ's gift and we see God's presence. On the other, we see lights, mist, and sin's pleasures. The difference between salvation and unbelief is as simple as continuing down one path consistently. Repentance is formally going down the path of sin as we all were, as we all sometimes still fail and do. But repentance is turning around 180, heading down the path to God instead, asking for forgiveness. So point number three on your sermon outline is this. Administer gospel genuinely. Administer gospel genuinely. Genuine administering of the gospel looks like meeting someone where they are. But it doesn't stop there. We meet them where we are. Then we bring them to the awareness of Christ. Making sure to leave room for God to work on them. It's not any one of those things. It's all of them together. Now, I'll be honest, I'll be frank. I can't hope to cover all the complexities of every scenario of the entire process. I'm finite with finite time. But I'll share some things that I've learned. Ready? And feel free to take notes as I go. I'll make sure to make sure to give time. Number one, pray earnestly for the person you're witnessing to. That's a no-brainer. Or at least it should be. You'd be surprised. Pray earnestly for the person you're witnessing to. The second thing you should do, pray that God would use you as a living testimony. Not just your words, your action, your life. Actions speak louder than? Good, you guys are following. Pray that God would use you as a living testimony. Number three, keep growing in your relationship with God. Keep growing in your relationship with God. Stay active. Stay on the ball. Because ultimately, as with the living testimony portion of it, if you're not doing it consistently, (laughs) you give rise to hypocrisy. Be aware of the fact that you might not get through to everyone you minister to. But still, share as God gives you inspiration. Don't say, Lord, it's a lost cause. Who are you to tell God that? Don't say, Lord, as Moses did, I I don't speak very well. That's not his problem. If he's using you, it's because he's already factored that in. If he's created you, it's because he knows what you're capable of. He's not asking you to do anything outside of your power. So don't tell him it's outside of your power. And hey, guess what? The best part, if it is, you know whose power it's not outside of? Tell me if I'm lying. Some people, however, at the end of the day, listening to everything you say, watching your living testimony, understanding that maybe you are speaking as God gives you inspiration. Some people might take all of that and walk away. That hurts. It stings. It does. Speaking from experience. But you know what? That's okay. Because it happens sometimes. And to young people, when I was in college, that happened to me too. That's all right. Sometimes you lose friends for that. That's all right. Because you know what? Losing friends isn't permanent. But if your love for God drives them away, what does it profit you to hang on to them and lose your soul? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You, You make a choice the same way. If you claim that God is number one in your life, you have to be willing to sacrifice to keep him there. It's that simple. It's that simple. My charge to the Christian is this. Administer the truth in love. Don't beat down on the person, but speak honestly and clearly with understanding that Christ has done the same for you, to you. To the unbeliever, presented with the foreign nature and concepts of Christ, God, and the Bible, be open-minded and truly give a listening ear to what is shared with you. Don't tune out simply because it doesn't seem reasonable, because 
be honest. If you're dealing with a miracle worker, not everything's going to fit within the laws. Not everything's going to fit within our logic. But it's his nature because he is a miracle worker. Nonetheless, everyone, I want you to do something with me here for a second, right? Let's just reset. Everyone take a deep breath with me. Ready? In and out. And one more. In and out. Good. Let's recap. Point number one, we must approach God on his terms. One more time. We must approach God on his terms. Point number two, we must apply scripture truthfully. We must apply scripture truthfully. And number three, we must administer gospel genuinely. Look, ignorance can be a problem in society as a whole. We're all susceptible to it. Christian, atheist, unbeliever, evolutionist, we all have our moments. However, in any case, we, it's talking to the Christians first, we have to start by asking God to cleanse us and open our minds to his truth before we can ever hope to approach, address, or assist an unbelieving brother or sister or family member. Even more than this, as we are constantly, unapologetically bombarded by hundreds of voices and opinions on the news, in the games we play, in the things we listen to, in the music, all of it, we have to personally decide where our center is and hold fast to it. My final charge to the Christian, your center is God. Your anchor is his word. Remain steadfast. It's like that. But to the unbeliever, I suggest, not commanding you, I suggest that you turn to God. Not as a magical genie. That's not what he does. Not as an evil tyrant. That's not who he is. But rather, as a loving savior and an honest friend who will never abandon you when you call. God is our only hope against the invasion of ignorance. But friends, he's one who always does good. Let's pray.